Well, good morning. Good morning. Can we go to the Lord in prayer one more time, please? Father, you know me very well, uh, better than I know myself, and you know my inadequacies. You know my insignificance in the grand scheme of things. And, and so anything that good that comes out of today, out of this message today, is from you. I mean, it's, it's completely from you, and you alone will be glorified. So, Lord, we just pray that uh, that's what will happen, is that, um, that uh, the, the messenger will fade in the background, and the message will, will become clear and, and overall. And so uh, we just commit this time to you, uh, just looking to you and, and trusting in you uh, for the rest of this time, uh, for the message and for the prayer time. In our Savior's worthy name we pray, amen. amen. All right, you can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. We'll go back there one more time this week. So I've titled this message, How Should We Now Live? How Should We Now Live? You know, I love how the Lord directed uh, the theme for this week. I love that it's all about Him, His name, His kingdom, His provision, His forgiveness, and His holiness. I love that. Um, <clears throat> the sooner this truth grips us, that is all about him and not us, the sooner we'll move forward in his power in our generation. One is well said, the sooner self is in the dust and ashes of repentance, the better. The sooner that self is in the dust and ashes of repentance, the better. Andrew Murray said, uh, he defined holiness this way, to lose sight of self. And to seek only God's glory, this is holiness. I like that, and I agree with that. Think about what our Lord Jesus has called us to. He said to deny self, to take up your cross, which is to die to self, and follow him. When we obey him in this, we walk with him, and we'll walk in holiness like him. We'll be like him, which, by the way, I believe is the ultimate goal of the Christian life. Christ likeness. You know, God's pretty committed to that. He's pretty committed to that. In fact, in eternity past, he said, I'm going to predestinate all those that are in Christ to be perfectly conformed to his image one day. Right? And that's going to happen one day. Uh, God is so impressed with his son that he wants all of heaven filled with people just like him. And he's going to do it. He's going to do it. And so he said, I'm going to predestinate those that are in Christ to be like him. And so that's what it's all about. That's what the Christian life is all about, is to be like Christ, to love like Christ, uh, to hate like Christ. You know, the Lord Jesus says, it says of him that he hated iniquity. He loves righteousness and hates iniquity. We need to hate iniquity in all of its forms. But it's all, this is what it's all about. It's about him. It's about him. You know, our God, he's a revealing God, isn't he? He's a communicating God. And I'm so thankful for that. We've got an entire book of his communications to us. And we would do well to study it as much as we possibly can. You know, Daniel said it like this. Daniel said, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. He revealeth the deep and secret things. And then Moses said it like this. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which he's revealed belong to us. Isn't that interesting? So God has revealed certain things to us, and, and so why do you suppose he does that? Like, why do you think God reveals things to us? Is it just to kind of satisfy our curiosity? Or is it to, um, I don't know, fill our head with, with knowledge, with information? Is that why God reveals things to us? Well, I don't think so. I don't think so. So we come to the final day today uh, for this week. And we're reminded again of the holiness of God. Kind of the theme for this day, for this morning, His holiness. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, uh, God has chosen to reveal in His Word pictures or visions, if you will, of His holiness. Of His complete and absolute holiness. Why has He done that? You know, He goes to great lengths and He goes to a lot of trouble to reveal these things to us. To communicate to us. And so why? I ask him, why does he do this? Well, 
let's think about the, uh, the burning bush. We're all familiar with the burning bush, the account of Moses at the burning bush. You know, Moses on the backside of the desert taking care of his uh, father-in-law's sheep. He runs across this bush. It's on fire, but it's not being consumed. Well, that's kind of a weird thing. It's a, an interesting thing. So he said, I'm going to turn aside. I'm going to look at this, see what's going on with this bush. And uh, <clears throat> the Lord called out to him from the bush. and He said, don't come near. Take off your shoes because the ground that you're on is holy. The ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. That's the first occurrence of the word holy in, in the entire Bible. And I know you, you Bible students, Bible scholars, you all know that's an important thing. Right? When you see the first occurrence of a word in Scripture, that's an important thing. And we need to pay attention to that. So the ground whereon you stand is holy ground, he said. Why did God reveal that to Moses? Well, I think that he wanted a response from Moses. He wanted a right response from Moses. In this case, he said, take your shoes off. And Moses did. He responded appropriately. He responded appropriately. He wanted a response from him. Now, why was the ground holy? I mean, it was just dirt, right? I'm, I bet Moses had been there many times around that area, taking care of the sheep, feeding the flock and what have you. But it was holy this time because God was there. It was the presence of God that made the ground holy. Um, and so now it was holy ground uh, because of the presence of a holy God. Now think about that. If his presence can make dirt holy, how much more for where he actually dwells and for whom he dwells in? God expects a right response from us today, from this week. He's revealed things in his, in his word to us, things that we've maybe heard before, but we're reminded this week, but he's still expecting a right response from us. And that's what we need to do. Open your, well, we're already opening our Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Let's go ahead and read this one more time. Um, this is a, a great passage, and we'll, we'll read it one more time. Beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And what do you think it means to be delivered from evil in this context? You know, I think a lot of times we think about the evil that's on the outside, you know, the, the, the devil and the world and maybe evil men and such. That's kind of how I, I look at it uh, many times as I've read this. But as I've lived my Christian life, and I've been a Christian since I was 10 years old, I've come to the conclusion, well, I've long since come to the conclusion, that my worst enemy is me. All right? And so my worst enemy, the greatest hindrance in my life to being the man of God that God wants me to be, is Eric Michelson, period. I mean, there, there's no, it's not even close, to be honest with you, it's not even close. And so um, it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil of me. That's how I see it. That's how I see it. And around 66 AD, a holy man of God was nearing the end of his life. In fact, it was going to be a violent end of his life. And he was pinning his last words to some of his dear friends. Uh, he had likely poured his heart and soul into these folks, and he wanted them to go forward with Christ. He wasn't going to. He knew that his time had come to go and be with the Lord. Uh, shepherding the flock of God. That's what he was doing. That's what he was teaching, uh, just like his Lord had taught him. And he would soon put off his tabernacle, just like the Lord had showed him. So he wanted to give the, the folks that he was writing to, he wanted to give them a challenge, a charge, if you will. Uh, he had been teaching them, uh, living this life in front of them, and he'd been teaching them deep things of God. I mean, these are, you, you think about what the Lord has revealed to us. These are deep truths of the living God. And they belong to us. Remember, those things that he's revealed belong to us. So this man, our dear brother Peter, he comes to the end of his life, and he, um, at the end of this little letter that we call Second Peter, 
he writes these words. He says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Does this speak to us today? Does this speak to us today in the 21st century? Nearly 2,000 years later? Does it move us? What's our response to what God's revealed to us this week? What's our, what's our response going to be? Well, the response that, that, that God was looking for in those folks in that day was a life of holiness and godliness. Can we say it like this? Taking into consideration what we've heard this week and what we know to be true, what we've heard many times before maybe, how are we now going to live? How should we now live? Like, do these things matter to us? Is it like, we're we just going to go on with our life like, like these things haven't been revealed to us? Or are we going to, to live the way he wants us to live? Um, <clears throat> will the truth change us? Will we let the truth, the truth change us? The Lord Jesus said, like, said this. He said, sanctify them or make them holy in his prayer that we were reminded of yesterday. Sanctify them, make them holy. How? Through thy truth. Thy word is truth. There was Pilate's answer. Pilate asked what was truth. He didn't get the answer then, but the Lord gave the disciples the answer. Thy word is truth. Uh, the, the word of God. Sanctify them through the word of God and what's been revealed. So we will, let the, will we let this truth change us? You know, it's interesting to note as you read that verse in 2 Peter, it's uh, chapter 3, verse 11, if you want to look at that. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that he doesn't allow them to answer the question. He answers it for them. Like, how are you going to, what, what manner of persons ought you to be? How are you going to now act? How are you going to now behave? Well, he says it needs to be in holy conversation or behavior, manner of life, and godliness. Holiness of lifestyle and godliness of character. It's internal and external. Right? In other words, it, it's, it's entire, the entire being. God is looking for this out of our entire being. He's looking for a transformation of our entire being. Well, that's like, that's like Jesus, isn't it? Was he holy inside and out? Did he have a holy lifestyle? Did he have godliness of character? Of course he did. Of course he did. And that's what God is expecting from us. One is internal, one is external, one is outwardly, and one is inwardly. God is looking for entire transformation. So what's the key? I mean, I'm not telling you guys anything new. This is all, you've heard this before, right? What's the key? What's, what's the missing link? Listen to what Andrew Murray says. Again, we'll listen to him again. It may sound simplistic. Now, as, you're, as I'm reading this quote, it may sound simplistic, but it's absolutely accurate. He says, the link between redemption when you were saved, and, and holiness, practical holiness we're talking about here, is, you ready for it? The link, the key. Obedience. Obedience, that's it. That's what he said, and I, I agree with that again. He says this, in obedience, the will is molded, the character is fashioned, and an inner man built up which God can clothe and adorn with the beauty of holiness. When a Christian discovers that this has been the missing link, the cause of failure and darkness, there is nothing for it but in a grand act of surrender to deliberately choose obedience. Universal, wholehearted obedience. That's it. As the law of his life in the power of the Holy Spirit in the power of the Holy Spirit, let him not fear to make his own words of Israel at Sinai. Remember what they said at Sinai? They said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now, how'd they do with that? How'd they do with that? They didn't do real well with that, did they? But they didn't have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them. Amen. That's the key. That's the key. We do. We do. So in the power of the Spirit of God, we can obey the, the commandments of the Lord. Now, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God has done by the gift of his Son and his Spirit. The law giving of Sinai on tables of stone has been succeeded by the law giving of the Spirit 
on the tables of the heart. The Holy Spirit is the power of obedience. That's in the end of the quote by Andrew Murray. The Holy Spirit is the power of obedience. Can I say it like this? God actually wants his will done. I mean, what's the point of praying, thy will be done? Right? He, he actually, just do it. He wants it done. Um, as it is in heaven, do the angels do the will of God, the heavenly host, the angelic host? They do the will of God, right? Um, he wants his will done. He actually wants it will, his will done. And that's through obedience. That's through obedience. So what's the motivation for obedience? Well, obviously, the, the Spirit of God motivates us. Uh, because he's wanting that. He's wanting us to, to be like Christ. That's his goal. Uh, but, you know, like Peter, it's kind of an intellectual, it's a logical argument that Peter brings forth. Say, look, all these things are going to be dissolved. Like everything you see, it's, it's, it's going to be melted with fervent heat. It's done. So why would you live for that? Why would you live for that? And when we learn this week that, that it's all about him, about all about the Lord Jesus, his, his name, his kingdom, his will, his provision, his forgiveness, his holiness. Why would you live for anything else? It's about him, right? So there's a logical, uh, intellectual argument there. It's reasonable. You know, it's your reasonable to, to give your, your body as a living sacrifice. It's a reasonable thing to do. Given what we learned in in Romans 1 through 11, right? It's completely reasonable. If we didn't know that, maybe it wouldn't, we wouldn't think it would be so reasonable. But God has revealed those things to us, and so it becomes reasonable. Our response should be uh, a life of holiness and godliness. But there's another motivation for obedience. Um, listen to what the Lord says. He says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loves me. Do we have his commandments? Yeah. We do. We're right here. New Testament's filled with commandments. Sometimes we think that, well, Old Testament's commandments and New Testament's grace and, and all that, but the New Testament's filled with commandments. He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. Jabe Nicholson defined holiness this way. So we got kind of a definition by Andrew Murray, what he thought holiness was. Jabe Nicholson says this, Holiness is a love relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. And I agree with that too. I agree with that too. It's so true. You know, when you are in that intimate place with Jesus Christ, sin loses its appeal. It does. It, it actually does because you don't want anything to hinder or interfere with that relationship with the Lord Jesus. So... Holiness is a love relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the heart side to me. This is more motivational to me. The, the logical side, I mean, I, that's motivational. I get it. But sometimes, you know, I've gone into sin knowing full well the, the logic of Scripture and, the, and the, the words of Scripture and still gone into sin. But when I'm pursuing an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, sin loses its appeal. It just simply does. And nothing compares to him, and you want nothing to come in between you and him. Nothing compares to him, does it? Read Hebrews. I mean, that's the whole point of Hebrews, is that Jesus is better. He's better than everything. He's better than everyone. He's better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. He's better than Joshua. He's better than the sacrifices. He's better than the tabernacle. He's better than all that. He's better. He's superior, the supremacy of Christ. And so why would we want anything else but him? Open your Bible sometime, and I know you do, but I want to encourage us to do that and just look for him. Behold him. The scripture says four times, it says, behold your king, behold my servant, behold the man, and behold your God. Behold. I love that word. We don't use behold a lot anymore, but it's a great old English word. It means to be held by something. To, when you're looking at something, to be so captured by it that you're just beholden to it. Amen. And you're held uh, in that, that gaze. And so that's what the scripture says. Behold, be captivated by the Lord Jesus. Behold him. 
You know, let's see if we can catch Isaiah's view when, he, when Isaiah saw him high and lifted up. What a view that was. What a view that was. You know, in the previous chapter in Isaiah 5, he's, he pronounced woe to the people. He said, woe to them, woe to them. You know, that's the, the passage where it says woe to them that call evil good and good evil. Woe to them. Five times, I think six times, I think he says woe to them. But in chapter 6, it's woe to me. Because he saw the Lord and he saw himself as what he really is. A man of unclean lips, dwelling amongst the people of unclean lips. And so he hit the deck, didn't he? But he caught, it, he caught that view of the Lord high and lifted up. So maybe we could see that. Maybe we could catch that and behold him in that way. But then maybe we could see him too as uh, the men who, sitting down, they watched him there. That's a view, isn't it? Wow. Think about that view. To see the Lamb of God on the cross dying for you and for me, bearing our sin in his own body on the tree in the darkness there, alone, crying out to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Sitting down, they watched him there. So read through the scripture again and listen to him. I tell you what, the, the, the words of the Lord Jesus have endeared him to me. Oh, I love uh, to read the scriptures, to read how he, he spoke with people, the compassion that he had. <clears throat> and truly, I mean, it was his enemies that said, never a man spake like this man. It wasn't even his friends that said that. They had to admit it, right? It's so true. It's so true. No one's ever spoken like him. You remember the, the passage in Mark, Mark chapter 2, I think we may have referenced it, but, uh, or Mark chapter 1, actually. Um, and the leper comes to the Lord and says, Lord says, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, if you're willing, if you're willing, you can, you can make me whole. You remember what the Lord said? In Mark, it says that he was moved with compassion. He reached out and touched him. I love those little extras like that, the little uh, view of the compassion and tenderheartedness of the Lord. But he said, I will. So he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can do this. And he said, I will. I want to. I love that. I want to. You know, it's one of the few times the Lord actually expressed his own will. You know, he came to do the will of the Father. But there were times when he expressed his own will. He said, I will. Another time was when he said, I will build my church. I will build my church. That's our Lord Jesus. Uh, if our faith is wavering a bit and we can't quite catch those views, uh, maybe we can at least touch the hem of his garment and be blessed. Increase our faith. You know, uh, that's been a, this beginning of this year. I've, I've been asking the Lord to teach me to pray. And I've been asking also the Lord to increase my faith. Those are kind of the two themes for me this year. But uh, increase our faith. Uh, two things the disciples asked the Lord. Um, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So one of, one of the, my ideas is to immerse myself in scripture more this year. And that increase my faith. I mean, that's what the Bible says. The faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we think of that as a gospel text a lot of times, but it, I think it applies to Christians too. George Mueller, did he have the gift of faith? He said he didn't. He said he didn't. His own testimony was that he did not have the gift of faith uh, uh, in, the, in the sense of 1 Corinthians 12. He didn't have the gift of faith. But it could be, you know, he went through the scriptures multiple, multiple hundred times in, in, I think, his lifetime. Maybe that was the reason for his faith. He was committed to the word of God. He was a man of prayer, but he was a man of the book, too. Lord, increase our faith. Uh, but it's so vital. This, this is so important. Holiness, um, manner of life, and godliness of character. It's so important. It's the key to everything that we want to be and everything we want to do for the Lord. It really is. I'm convinced of that. Without it, we will not accomplish all that he wants us to. We will not be all that he wants us to be without practical holiness. You know, in Hebrews 12, it says to pursue holiness. You know, there's a positional side and, and there's a practical side, right? I mean, we understand that. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir there. So we're not talking about positional. We're talking about practical because you don't have to pursue positional holiness. You already got that. Mm -hmm. Got that at salvation, right? At justification. We, we got that. But practical, the practical side, you got to pursue it. And the Lord says, the rest of that verse, if you don't have it, you won't see the Lord. You won't see the Lord. And that's what we're wanting to do is see the Lord. We want to see the Lord, but we see Jesus. You know, that's a present tense. We see Jesus with the eye of faith. 
But we see him nonetheless, right? It's no less real. But we see Jesus. We're looking off unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So Joshua said this um, about 3,500 years ago. You know, the, the, the first generation that came out of Egypt, they failed, didn't they? Mike reminded us the other night that they had an evil heart of unbelief. In the rest of that verse, actually in Hebrews, it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Right? So that's to us. We need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of that. But um, So that, the first generation had failed. Their carcasses fell in the wilderness. But the next generation, they came up. And uh, we have a new leader, uh, a man whose name was Salvation, and Moses changed it to what? Jehovah's Salvation. And we're not going to let this man take credit for this. It's Jehovah's Salvation. So Joshua led the people into the promised land, and he said this to them right before they entered in, right before they crossed the Jordan. He says, sanctify yourselves. Why? Why? For tomorrow... The Lord will do wonders among you. But the first thing, sanctify yourselves. You know, this is New Testament truth too, you know. If people say, well, that's Old Testament, brother. That's Old Testament. That's New Testament too, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting, what? Holiness in the fear of God. Right? It's New Testament truth, too. Um, and, and we're talking about, we're not talking about, I want to make this clear, we're not talking about having a gun in the spirit, are we now made perfect in the flesh? I'm not talking about that. We're not talking about pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps and doing this. We're going to, you know, we're going to do this by our own power. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. It's the Holy Spirit of God. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. He's the power. He's the power. Um, Peter said it like this. He said all the, that according to his divine power, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So he's already given us. So we, we can't say, Lord, I can't do it. Man, it's just too hard. He says, no, 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 no. I've already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. Virtue. You know, uh, about 18 years ago, I was actually uh, praying to the Lord one day, and this is interesting. Most people don't actually pray this. Most people just kind of drift into this kind of life, but I actually prayed one day. I said, Lord, you know what? Um, man, this is hard. <clears throat> I said, Lord, you know what? Uh, I want to live for you, but it's just too hard. It's just too hard, and so I'm out. I'm out. And uh, it was 11 years that I was out. 11 years, because I said, I told the Lord it's too hard. But you know what I found out is that the way of the transgressor is hard. Mm -hmm. That's hard. The Christian life is not hard. But the way of trans the trans transgressor is. All right, so, so it's not too hard. We can't say, Lord, it's too hard. Can't say that because... Uh, if, if, if someone would have pointed this out to me, or if I would have uh, read uh, First Peter, or Second Peter actually, that he's already given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. We can live the Christian life. We can. You can live the life of holiness. You can. God has given you everything in order for you to do it, in order for me to do it. He's given us those things already. And uh, as we said last night, I think in our prayer, it's not optional. God is expecting that of us. He's expecting that of us. You know, um, do we want to see, my time's about up here, do we want to see um, spirit-led and spirit-filled revivals in America and around the world? I know we do. Of course, it's one of the reasons we're here, right? We pray for a revival. It's kind of how this thing started. We want to see revival. We want to see that sweep the land. And I know that we want to see the gospel go forth in renewed zeal and power in this generation. Man, I tell you that I am so... Man, I just don't want to miss what God has saved us for in this generation. I don't want to miss it. I'm desperately not... Desperately don't want to miss it. All right, so I want everything that he wants to accomplish through us, I want to see done. 
So we want, to see, we want to see the gospel go forth in, in new power and new zeal and all of that. You know, I just read that, I think I shared an email with, with the guys um, about uh, um, 40% of the world's population, and I, don't, I, don't, I didn't check these statistics, so maybe somebody could do that, some of these statisticians out there, statisticians out there, but 40% um, uh, of the world's population has never heard of Jesus Christ. They don't have the opportunity to hear of Jesus Christ. And I mean, even if that's off by a little bit, there's still, it's still a lot, right? There's billions, billions that haven't heard the gospel. We've got to get busy. The Lord thought it was reasonable to, 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 to give this message to 11 men. He thought it was reasonable for when he said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, to me, it's like, wow, to every creature? Lord, 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 we're just a little band of little men. The Lord thought it was reasonable. He thought it was logical. Go do it. And you know what it says? It says, the Lord, they went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord working with them. Lo, I'm with you always, even at the end of the age. That's the key, right? <laughs> That's the key. And so because of that, we can do it. And he expects us to do it in this generation. Man, this generation, we, we need to go forward with him so we can accomplish these things for his glory. We want to see millions saved, baptized, and brought into the assembly, brought into our churches, and, and taught whatsoever the things that he's taught us, right? We want to see that built up, and then, and then they go out, and it just starts all over again. That's the, that's the whole point. Uh, we want to see that. We want to see, do we want to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being made conformable to his death? We want to, we want to know him in that way? Those would be wonders. Those would be real, palatable wonders. Well, we need to sanctify, sanctify ourselves, and the Lord will do these wonders among us. These are real, authentic wonders, and, and, and we want to see that. Um, one last verse, and we'll close. One last verse. Le Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45. Leviticus eleven forty-five. <clears throat> it says this, for I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. God's expecting a response from us. He says, look, I, I'm revealing to you that I'm a holy God. I'm revealing the fact of my holiness to you, and so I'm expecting a response, a right response from you. Therefore, be ye holy. I brought you out of Egypt, a picture of justification, right? We know that redemption and all that. We get that. This is therefore, because I've saved you, I've justified you, I've declared you righteous. Therefore, be holy as I am holy. Sanctification. Justification, I brought you out of Egypt. Sanctification, you should be holy as I am holy. Father, these are deep things of God. Lord, you've revealed them to us for a reason, for a purpose. Oh, Lord, we, we desperately need to pursue holiness. I desperately need to pursue holiness. Lord, I, I want to see you. I want to go forward with you. And that's the way. That's the way. Um, a, a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, would you, would you reveal the Lord Jesus to us in, in fresh new ways that we would just once again, just bow in awe and admiration and adoration of his person, of his work. Uh, Lord, we're, we're amazed at him, uh, the one who, who could speak worlds into existence, the one who is upholding all these things by the word of his power. We, we see him that very one on the cross of Calvary. And we say, how can that be? How can that be? Lord, why would you allow that? 
And Lord, we, we see that three days later he rose again. Lord, we see that now he's ascended high, lifted up. We see that he's ever living to intercede for us. Lord, what should our response be to these things? These are, to me, there's no, there's no other response but to, to bow and, and fall down and, and, and in obedience live out what he would have us to do. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters but what he wants. It's his kingdom, his name, his will, his righteousness, his provision, his holiness. Lord, help us. Uh, we are here today, and we uh, acknowledge our failures. Lord, I, um, I have failed you so many times. I'm so inadequate in and uh, all of that. But Lord, we, we want to go forward. We want, we, don't, we want to forget those things which are behind mm -hmm. and to press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself. Lord, help us. We, we long for this. We need this. Our generation needs um, this. The lost, people that don't know Jesus Christ, they need to see real, authentic Christianity lived out by Christians, how else are they going to see it? If Christians aren't living the life, how else are they going to see it? Oh, Lord, hypocrisy has killed us. It's killed us in the past. And I've been the biggest hypocrite out there. And it's, it's devastating to the cause of Christ. Lord, would you help us to, to repent? To repent and say, Lord, sanctify us. We're, we're going to go forward with you. We're going forward regardless because it's all about you and not about us. Lord, we, let us uh, put self in the dust and ashes of repentance uh, here and now, today. Let us die to self. Let us deny self. Let us die to self and take up our cross and follow the Lord Jesus where he's going, what he's doing, and be committed to him and his plan, his ways, his will. <coughs> oh, Lord, we're so thankful for the Lord Jesus. We're so thankful for the Spirit of God who bears with us daily. When we grieve him, when we quench him, he bears with us daily. Oh, Lord, help us. We desperately, desperately want to go forward. And so we just commit this time to you. Uh, Lord, move us. Um, change us. We want the truth of God to change us, to transform us. Or we don't want to be the same people. We, we've heard these things before, and we need to act. We need to act. Our time is now. It's all we have. Uh, for such a time as this, we're here. You, know, you, you could have put us in a different generation, but you didn't. You put us in this generation. It's, there, we have a purpose here. Our time is now. Lord, we prayed before. We, we wish that Paul was still here and that Peter was still here. They, they would be, that would be wonderful. We wish that John Wesley was here and Charles Wesley and, and George Whitfield, Jim Elliott, uh, Hudson Taylor, George. We wish those guys were here, but they're not. They're not. They accomplished their purpose. You, you, you worked out your purpose in them, and you called them home, and now it's up to us. It's our turn. It's our time. And we pray you help us. Lead us on. Lead us on, Lord Jesus. And we pray in your name. Amen.